Thank you so much, Montreal. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to our industry discovery uh, research seminar. Uh, so many of you, of course, who are here uh, do not need any introduction for Jean here. But definitely, you know, if you mention random media, the very first name that comes into my mind is Jean Pierre Fruit. And uh, definitely we can go on with, with his biography, but very briefly, Jean Pierre Fruit held position at the uh, CNRS, Le Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, a record of picnic in France before joining North Carolina State University in 1998, where he started actually the master's uh, of financial mathematics. And then since uh, 2006, he's professor in the Department of Statistics and Applied Probability at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and director of the Center of Financial Mathematics and Actuarial Research there. Uh, and again, you know, many of you know uh, quite well his uh, uh, books published by Cambridge University Press, by Schrödinger, um, and uh, he is editor-in-chief of the Science Journal of Financial Mathematics. Jean-Pierre is a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics since 2009, Science Fellow since 2011, and lives can go on and on and on. So please welcome Jean-Pierre uh, to, to our group. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Now I feel very old, <laughs> having done all this. So thank you very much. I mean, this uh, overview uh, visit to Waterloo. It's my first time in Waterloo. I've been visiting Toronto many times, but uh, not this place. So I'm glad to be here and talk to you guys. So I want to talk about uh, system risk. It, this is really the point of view of uh, a mathematician, which I am. I'm not uh, an economist. Or, so uh, I, let me give you the story. So first my quarters. They will be cited again, but Rome Carmona is at uh, Princeton. Mustafa Moussavi will be defending his dissertation on Monday. And Lee Sun uh, defended two years ago at his now position in Taiwan. So the story is like that. I mean, in the 2000s, we were working, let's say we, a lot of people were working on free derivatives. And boom, we had a big financial crisis. And that made us, at least some of us, I hope, uh, think about uh, what we could do to study a little bit more the stability of the banking system. So instead of looking at the pricing an option, or pricing a basket of, uh, of stocks, uh, or credit derivatives, or let's look at, the, at the, the banking system and see what we can say about it. So this grew a little bit after uh, 2008, uh, a group of us on the, on the internet started to think about this uh, idea of uh, uh, creating uh, maybe a national institute of finance. Uh, the idea grew up and it became the Office of Financial Research under the Treasury Department, which was created in 2010, uh, part of the Dodd-Frank Bill signed by our former president. And uh, so this has been uh, great, but we did a lot of work and uh, uh, I remember it was in Toronto actually during the Bachelier conference in 2010. Uh, maybe some, some of you remember what happened in, <laughs> at the end of that conference. <laughs> it was kind of active in Toronto. And uh, so with uh, Joe Lansan, from, uh, more former, uh, formerly at Morgan Stanley, we said maybe we have done so much work, people have so much contributed to ideas on systemic risk, why not putting together a book, handbook on systemic risk to start to help start people doing research on the systemic risk. And that was uh, the origin of the book that we put together with the writing and it's 1,000 pages on systemic risk that we co-edited and <coughs> uh, disappeared in 2013. So hopefully that book to help uh, some people. So I'm one of aspect of it from the mathematics point of view. And this is what I want to explain where I started. So my starting point was to say, OK, so let's look at the structural model. If, if you know a little bit about uh, default or credit derivatives, you model the, the value of a firm. And if the firm reaches a certain level, you declare that the firm is in default. That's called a structural model. And so when you have many firms, that's what we were doing in credit derivative, you have many firms, 
and we want to see the correlation of defaults. And so we wrote, we were working with this kind of system here. So this is a system of diffusions, right? We have n diffusions. And uh, when we were working with the structural uh, default of in credit derivatives, what happened is that the, the, the firm was traded, let's say, suppose the firm is a stock, right? The value of the stock, it was traded. So when you write a derivative, which is a credit derivative on, on those stocks, you are bound by risk neutrality, meaning that basically you have no choice of the drift. The drift has to be, let's say, the risk-free rate if you, if you are trading in credit derivatives and you are left to working with the bar in motion so you can correlate your bar in motion or volatilities. So this is what we were doing in a, for credit derivatives. Now thinking about system increase, now we look at banks and if you think, so for instance, this is a monetary reserve of the bank, this is not traded. You cannot trade monetary reserve of a bank. So uh, you are not bound by risk neutrality, and this is a system that you have to look at. Uh, so that was a starting point, saying that instead of focusing on the branding motion itself and the volatility, modeling complex model for volatility, let's make this very simple. Do those branding motion independent, and volatility make it constant. So we are not focusing on this part of the diffusion, but more on the drift, where now we have some uh, choices to make. So for instance, if you think that this is uh, money moving from bank I to bank J, actually it's log money, so that's a bit detailed, it's a little bit important because I want this to be extremely simple. This is a toy model, I want it to be gauche. So let's assume that this is log money and not discuss that further, but, but this can be fixed if we, if we like to. So, so, so now we have a choice on uh, the BI, and the choice that we proposed as a toy model to understand what was going on is to pick, a, a, to pick a, a drift of this form. So what exactly does this mean? This means that if uh, bank J is uh, richer, higher than bank I, then there is a flow of money from J to I, and vice versa, if J is smaller than I, then I is lending money to bank J. So this is a flow of money. You sum all these flows, and there is a renormalization here in case we want n goes to infinity that will be important, but for what we we'll be doing, it's not too important. And then there is a parameter in front of that which measure the strength of that drift. So the parameter A measures the strength of the drift. A is I, means there is a lot of money flowing. A is zero, there is no money flowing. Right? So that's, that's the idea. So, very simple model, and we want to understand the behavior of this system, which is extremely simple in this case, and I will show you how simple it is. So, the first thing is that this creates a, a, a financial network. In this financial network, everybody is linked to everybody in the same way. Everything is symmetric here. So, this is our network, so I take n equals 10 because I will show you some sample simulation. And what we are interested in is uh, you have a default level. We want to see when the reserve, it's a log reserve, so we start from zero, and the default level for the log reserve is negative. We want to see how many of these banks will reach the default level by time t. So we have a time horizon, and we want to see that. So let's, uh, let's simulate that. So for instance, if a equals one, meaning that this is a low money moving slowly, because 1 over n, right? So it's 1 over 10, so money is moving slowly. On the left, you have the coupled system of diffusion. On the right, you have the case A equals 0, meaning independent running motion. So these are the same shocks, same running motion, but one without coupling, and this one with coupling. So when A equals 1, there is not much difference. Some of the banks are defaulting, they reach the level. In this very simple model, even if a bank is defaulting, it stays in the system and continues to borrow and lend. So we make it very easy. We could remove it, but let's make it easy. You can even make it easier than that. Just count what happens at time t. Don't even look in between. You can do it if you want. So basically, there is not much difference when A equals 1. But if I increase, if I increase the liquidity, I will call A liquidity factor, if I increase the liquidity A equals 10, oh, now things are very different on the left. In the couple system, it seems that you gain stability. Everybody is staying together. But on the right, this is our <coughs> motion. They do what they have to do. 
If you increase again a 100, remember it's divided by 10, so it's, it's 10, really easy. The fact, oh, there we gain a lot of stability. So it seems that this system explains stability. You increase A, meaning you explain stability, all the banks are staying together. Well, this is called, uh, actually, uh, this, is, uh, this kind of system is a very simple version of things which, has been, uh, which have been uh, uh, studied in flocking. Uh, flocking of birds or, you know, it, it, it comes from something which already exists in, uh, in, uh, in a dynamical system, except we have the noise here, so it's... Uh, but, but this is not a new idea. So let's, let's, let's look at the loss distribution. In credit derivatives, you are interested, you have 10, 10 banks. How many of them are defaulting? And I want the distribution of this number of defaults. So this is what uh, I will do. First, if A equals zero, of course they are independent. And if they are independent, you get a binomial. And the parameter P of this binomial is at the probability that the minimum of this one motion uh, be, be below the uh, default level. And we have a formula for that, right? So in the case A equals zero, we have an exact formula to compare with. So this is a loss distribution. Again, if A equals one, there is not much liquidity. The binomial is this one, and the one that we have, uh, the one, this is a, a binomial, the one that we have with A equals 1 is basically the same as a binomial. It doesn't make much difference. On the right here, it's on the right, yes, on the right, uh, I'm blowing up this part because I'm interested in the, where we have a lot of default. So I'm blowing up the right tail of this distribution. So this is a blow up of this tail. There is not much activity here. I increase A. A becomes 10. Oh, but now the distribution is not a binomial at all. Something is going on. The distribution has change of nature. And if I look at the tail here, now something is happening. The probability is that 10 defaults, are 10 banks, that all 10 is defaulting is becoming 3%. So this is not negligible anymore. And if I increase A as we did before, then this is fairly easy to understand what's going on. The distribution is a binomial distribution. It's a binomial distribution. Big probability that there is zero default, meaning everything is good. That was the previous picture before. But there is still this small probability here that you don't see in the binomial. This small probability is that everybody default. And this is a blow up of this to 3.5% or something like that. So here there is the explanation of what we mean by systemic risk. We have a lot of stability because of that, but there is a small probability that everything goes wrong. And that's what we have in mind in terms of systemic risk. Right? Sorry. So, yes. Uh, what, is, what is not really is what is causing the default? That's what we will see. Oh you mean what is a mechanism? Yeah. Or what is it's simply like like the structural model. If your if your this is liquidity, right? If the liquidity goes below a certain level, then you are declaring default. That, that's a very very simple toy model of a definition of a default. There is no balance sheet of the bank. I just ignore this. It's just cash reserve. So it's a very toy model. I, I I see what you're asking. That you can make it more complex. Really get the real balance sheet of the, of the bank, but that is more complicated than this is, we are working on it, it's not about it. Take this as a very simple model which will explain the dynamical system and how the formation of the default. Okay, thanks. So, so this system can be rewritten like that, of course, if you sum up the drift, if you sum up the drift, you can write the drift as the, what I call the ensemble average, and the mean of all the banks. And if you read it like that, this looks like an Einstein Weinberg process, meaning that the bank I is attracted to the mean of the system. So it's attracted to something which is moving. Right? So, but on the other hand, if you want to compute that and you sum up all the DXI, if you sum up all the DXI, you will see that this is nothing else than the Brownian motion. By symmetry, the drift will disappear. And this is nothing, nothing else than a brand new motion. Right? So it means that this ensemble average behaves like a brand new motion, but with a small, a small volatility. Of course, if you compute the variance, you will see that this brand new motion 
actually has a small volatility of the order one over the square root of n. So now we have we have a start of an explanation. The bank x bank xi is attracted to this uh, Brownian motion with that, which has a small volatility. So the probability usually I mean this quantity will go to zero almost surely and prove that. But there is a small probability that you deviate from the mean, and this is in a large deviation regime. So now systemic risk will be associated to a large deviation behavior of the of the of, of the model of the system. So in fact, you can compute everything here in this simple example. You can solve this equation. You can rewrite this equation as n goes to infinity. If you want to see the limit, n goes to infinity. X i just goes to this Hirsch time and back. And this is what is called and well known since many years propagation of chaos. So the particles are becoming independent and they all become uh, Orstein independent or Steinman and Beck. We are not so interested in this limit here because if you take the limit and that's all you say, you have passed the large deviation regime. So you should be careful not to take the limit of law of large numbers because then you are forgetting the large deviation regime. So in this case, we are very lucky because we can compute everything and we did compute everything. So in this case, this is your large deviation principle. You take the probability, the small probability, this will be a small probability, take the log, 1 over m, and the large deviation tells you that there is a limit and we compute the limit. In this case, it's exactly computed. We can exactly compute this limit for this Gaussian system. So that tells you exactly the rate in the large deviation. So basically, this leads us to call systemic event when the ensemble average, or the minimum over time if you are looking at time, or only at t if you look at t, the ensemble average, or the average uh, liquidity, is, uh, is reaching the default level. That's what we call, in this case, a systemic event. And the idea is that if A is large, you increase A to increase the stability of the system. If A is large, then everybody will be flocking to the mean, but if you are in this uh, small probability or small event with small probability that the mean goes to default, everybody will be defaulting at center. So basically what we understand now is that uh, stability goes against, in some sense, uh, a system increase. If you increase A a lot, then once you are in this event, everybody will be defaulting. So there is something one is not going in the direction of the other, either stability or system increase. Right? So this is nice, this is a nice story, but I mean as you can see, this is a very simple model, there is no much economics behind it, and there, there is no decision. I just prescribed the dynamics of the banks, which is a little bit foolish because we know that banks are doing things, right? So this is a second paper that we wrote where we introduce, we try, we try to introduce what the bank is trying to do, maximizing profit or minimizing cost. So let's try to introduce a game where the banks will make choices and see what happens. Right? So this is a, and in particular, try to find the Nash equilibrium in this uh, stochastic game that we will write in a minute. So this is a work which is uh, published with Carmona uh, and uh, Leo Sun. And uh, so this is what we do. There is no delay left uh, yet, and I will introduce delay later. So this is a stochastic game, very simple stochastic game, where the bank I, or particle I if you want, or bank I, is choosing its rate of borrowing. So this is rate of borrowing or lending. Alpha I tells you the rate at which you borrow continuously in time, or you lend if alpha is negative. And of course, you have your noise here, and I took even sigma to be the same for everybody, so I make my life very simple. Also, I make my life simple in the sense that all these running motion are independent. I could have a common noise, a common noise for everybody. I'm not doing that yet for simplicity. Now, what is the what is the, the goal? The objective function for bank I. So this is the objective function for bank I. You try to minimize. So in this case, we minimize. We minimize the running cost. So this is a running cost and a terminal cost. And in this case, we take very particular form for the running cost and the and terminal cost. So the running cost has several terms. So this is one term here. So that is like a, not transaction cost, but the cost of moving money. 
no matter if you borrow or lend, money is moving, so there is a quality cost to pay because money is moving. Right? So this is his first term. The last term is kind of uh, uh, a penalization uh, for the system imposed on the system. We want the system, we want an incentive for the system to stay together. So I want this to be as small as possible, but I want to increase that, but I will pay, I will pay cost. And this is an incentive, this is a term which is an incentive to borrow and lend. So this is an incentive for money to flow. Let me explain that. So Q is a parameter, Q is positive. So if XI is less than the mean, so if XI is a bank in trouble, right, way below the mean, so this term is positive. If this term is positive, I have a negative sign here. I want to take alpha very negative, uh, very positive, sorry. So because I want to minimize, so very positive, meaning I want to borrow. So if XI is small, it's an incentive for this bank to borrow, and vice versa. If XI is large, then it's an incentive for the bank to lend money, to put money in the system. So this is our incentive, and then each bank is trying, and the terminal cost also quality, and each bank is trying to uh, minimize its uh, objective, and we want to find a Nash equilibrium for this uh, stochastic gain. Of course, we made choices here very simple, so that this is a linear quadratic uh, stochastic gain, it's linear here, quadratic in the, in, the, in, the, in the cost function, and we have a chance to be able to solve that, and that's exactly what will happen. We can solve this explicitly, this uh, funding is in Nash equilibrium for this, uh, for this game. Let me explain how this is uh, working. But before that, notice that we are in a situation where everything, the coupling is through the mean. And this is part of what is called mean field game. The theory of mean field game is very active since uh, more than 10 years. And there is a lot going on in that, in that, uh, in that area. But when we say mean field gain, there is the idea that n goes to infinity. So you have many, many particles, and you want to look at the limit n goes to infinity, hoping that this limit will be easier to solve than the gain with, let's say, one million particles. Uh, here, the banking system is not one million, but n is large in general. So, so here we, we design this model so that we can solve for n finite. We are not talking about n goes to infinity, but we could. So, for instance, I mean, here if I have a, a coefficient, if this coefficient depends on the mean in a nonlinear way, there is no way I can solve that. But in the limit, I could solve it. So, the, the field of I'm advertising, the field of mean, mean field game here, because this is really, really something interesting. Going. On. But let's continue with this uh, linear quality system. So, how do you solve that? You, you, you write the Hamiltonian of the... So first, I'm, I'm looking for Markovian uh, strategies. So alpha is a function of Tnx, so I'll make it uh, simpler. And I write the Hamiltonian of the system, so this is the Hamiltonian of the system, and the yi here is the adjoint variable in this Hamiltonian. And of course, this is your cost function. You try to minimize the Hamiltonian. If you minimize in alpha, this is your alpha hat, that gives you your alpha hat. And now, at this point, since you have a, at this point, usually you don't know how to solve, but since we have a linear quadratic uh, system, there is a natural ansatz for, for it. Typically, the value, we expect the value function to be quadratic. The y, the y which is here, the adjoint variable, is a derivative, is a gradient of the value function. So if the value function is quadratic, we have in mind that the value function should be quadratic. The gradient should be linear, and that's how this ansatz shows up. The just shows up as a gradient of the of the value function, but still there is this, this is the uh, delta ij equals one or zero depending if i equals zero or not. Uh, eta t is a function, a deterministic function which is unknown yet. We have to find this function, and we have to find this is an answer, so we have to verify that this is a solution. So this is what we do, and how do you do that? You write the forward equation. So the forward equation is your equation for xi. That's a usual way to treat. Hamiltonian system, you take the derivative with respect to y of the Hamiltonian, you write your forward equation using your ansatz, and then you write the backward equation, so for the adjoint equation, you have a backward equation, forward equation for the x, backward for the y with a terminal condition, and you have to differentiate the Hamiltonian with respect to x with a negative sign because you go in the other direction of, of, uh, of the time, and then you have your noise here, and since we have a 
backward equation, backward stochastic equation. This is part of the unknown. You have to find the z's that you have to put in front of the noise so that this has a solution and this should be adapted. It doesn't mean that you solve the backward equation. This coefficient should be adapted to the Brownian motion. So that's the difficulty of this kind of equation. But in any case, you compute your gradient here, and this is a form that you obtain. You obtain the drift, and this is your noise, and you have a terminal condition. The terminal condition is imposed by your g, by the function g. So now that you solve that, yes? Sorry, pardon me if we get up. Just a dumb question. So because what I don't understand is, see, the costs here are not really exogenous. And just coming purely from an economic point of view. Yes. The costs are not really exogenous because banks are lending to each other. Yes. Through essentially some sort of a like collateral, right? So if they're not they're not collateral free lending. So so in other words the value of the the cost of the loan is determined by some sort of a they have a first priority, there's some sort of securitized. So, so far you shouldn't think in terms of loan. Mm -hmm. Later maybe we can think in terms of loan, that will be the, the, the last part. It's money flowing, right? It's liquidity. Think about liquidity. And you want liquidity. So when when you flow, you have to pay. It's like the flow. The flow has a resistance. That's a quadratic resistance. No matter which way it goes, this is the alpha square. This is the cost to pay for money flow. And uh, in the objective, I input some incentive for the money to flow. Right? So I design the problem. It's not, the bank is not choosing the objective, I impose that objective. Previously, I imposed a dynamics. I made a progress, right? Now I impose the objective and I let the bank decide what they want to do. Right? How much money they want to flow. Right? So, little by little, we try to build something which is closer to the real world. Little by little. Right? So, we want to solve that. To solve this, what you do is... Um, you, yes. What is y? Yes, so when you write the Hamiltonian, you introduce an adjoint variable. The adjoint variable will go backward and the x variable will go forward. x is a dynamics, that's your dynamic of the x. y tells you your, later on we will talk about the AGB equation, it tells you your, your optimal problem, you try to solve an optimal problem. You know the end. You know the terminal value, and you have to solve backward. And now you see you have a forward equation coupled with a backward equation. And so y is the solution of this backward equation, and we wrote this, uh, this equation for y, which is given by taking the gradient of the Hamiltonian. Right? Okay. Yeah. No, the, the y is the gradient of the value function. It's a gradient of the value function. When we will deal with AGB equation, it will be the value form. So, how do you solve that? You take your ansatz and you differentiate your ansatz. So, for instance, in the ansatz you have the x-bar. You compute the x-bar. It's very easy to compute. And then you differentiate by using Ito's formula. You use Ito's formula and you differentiate your ansatz. So, now you see we have two Ito's representation of the same object. We have one Ito's representation given by differentiating the ansatz. And previously, we have an Ito's representation given by the Hamiltonian. Now we want to identify these two representations because we know that they are unique. And if you identify the Martingale term or the Rhinel term, here's what you should choose for your z. So that's nice because this is deterministic. So z will be adapted automatically. So if I know what is a function eta t, then I know exactly what is z and I'm fine with that term. This is not a problem. It's not an issue. But I still need to know this function eta, and for that I identify the drift of the two equations. By ident identifying the drift of the two equations, I find an equation for eta. And this equation is nice, it's an ODE versus an ODE, this is a deterministic quantity, it's an ODE, and it's of a Riccati type. And uh, I didn't tell you anything about these parameters, but I have a condition in my objective function where epsilon is greater than q squared, to make everything convex. So I have a convex optimization problem. So I have a condition on epsilon being greater than q, q uh, squared. 
and I have a terminal condition for my backward Riccati equation. The only thing to know, the only thing to do here to make sure that the system has a solution, this is a solution of the system, is to make sure that the solution of this equation exists. It doesn't blow up. And you have to be careful with the Riccati equation, it can blow up. So we know how to write the, we know how to write the solution of this equation. Uh, we know how to solve the Riccati equation, and it's easy to show that under the condition that I just specified, there is a solution, it doesn't blow up in any time. So, so we have the solution, we identify the solution, we have a Nash equilibrium, right? So, financial implication for this Nash equilibrium. So under this Nash equilibrium, the optimal choice for the bank I is given by this. This is what we had from the beginning. Now I know what is Y. I computed it by my hand, that's. And this is the, the, the alpha hat. Now, as you see, the alpha hat is even is symmetric, is again symmetric in all the j. So when I will be summing up all the xi's, this root will disappear again. So this means that in terms of systemic risk, I'm like in a previous situation, without the gain. The systemic risk is given by the behavior of x bar. And x bar is still this running motion with a small volatility. So basically, under the Nash equilibrium for this game, Systemic risk is exactly described as before. That's the first conclusion. Second conclusion, under this, uh, under this uh, uh, Nash equilibrium, remember, which is given by X bar, I can undo X bar. I can do the opposite operation that I did previously, and I can rewrite the dynamics like this. Instead of writing X bar, I can write 1 over n, the sum of the xj and rewrite my grid like that. So now I look at this and say, well, this is nice because under the Nash equilibrium that we found, basically this was the, the very simple model that I proposed at the beginning. So at the beginning, this simple dynamical model was supposed to be like uh, done in some sense, but it's not so done. It's a Nash equilibrium of something which is more complicated, which is a game between banks. It's not exactly the same because there is a T dependence here, but this is not much uh, a problem. So I will, I will comment on that a little bit uh, later. But what is important, this is the, the effective rate of flowing, money flowing. What is important is, again, when I, I sum all the alpha i's, I get zero by symmetry, and this is what we we name the clearinghouse property, meaning that in the beginning, you should have asked the question, bank I is borrowing money, but from where? I, I didn't say it. So from a central bank, let's say. But in the end, this didn't matter in this problem because of this clearinghouse property, meaning under the equilibrium, if the banks are optimizing their, their objective, then the central bank doesn't play any role. It's just a clearinghouse, money is flowing, and the sum of money is a zero-sum game, in some sense, right? So this is a nice uh, property of the clearinghouse, and th the effect of the game is that it created liquidity, money is flowing between banks, and we know that if money is flowing, you create stability. So that's good. Bank are, banks are creating stability by money flowing. That's easy to understand. Small banks can borrow, so they get saved, and everything is nice, except if the noises are getting together and they do something bad and everybody will follow, right? So that's the idea. And the last, uh, last application, if you take T large, you can get rid of the dependence in small t. If you take the maturity large enough, for most, for most of the time, this eta is a constant and you have a constant rate of, uh, of uh, uh, flowing, of liquidity. And even, even if you take n goes to infinity, which is a mean field limit, you get a constant, and now you get exactly the system that I proposed at the beginning. And so this is how this A is constructed. The rate of liquidity or the liquidity parameter is given by this Q, which was the incentive for borrowing and lending, and this is bar, which is given by the solution of this Riccati equation. Right? Well, now let's again criticize the model. Money is, you borrow money, from somewhere, it's nice. The central bank doesn't have to provide liquidity or get liquidity because you have this clearing as uh, property. But I mean, when you borrow money, at some point you should be 
you should give it back, right? That's, that's the idea of, uh, of money. And so this is our incentive for us to put delay in this equation. So this is a, the most recent work. It's not still accepted, but hopefully it will be accepted soon. So we, we revisit our model by putting a constraint where you borrow money, you have to give it back. So let's say now we talk about loan in some sense, with a loan of only one maturity, tau. Tau is given, it's not a stopping time. Tau is given, let's say, one day or three days, whatever it is. So it means that at time t, you have to give back what you borrowed or lent, depending on the sign, tau days before. Right? So your drift is given by your choice and what you have chosen three days before to do. So now you see that this problem, I didn't, I didn't change at all the objective. The objective is still the same. Keep the objective as the same. Make it step by step. You could put some delay in the objective. I didn't put, do that. Just the objective in the uh, dynamics. What makes this problem a little bit complicated is that the delay is in the control. The delay is in the control. A lot has been done in the delay on the state. Not the control, the A in X, but not on the control. So that makes things a little bit uh, more difficult. When we looked at this problem, we say, well, let's see what uh, the literature uh, says on delay. So if you look on uh, uh, delay, stochastic differential, uh, stochastic differential, SDEs with delay, there is a lot done in the last 25 years, a lot of work. If you look at uh, stochastic control with delay, there is quite a lot of work done. But when we looked at uh, uh, stochastic differential gains with delay, there was nothing, basically nothing done, except for uh, delay in a deterministic case some long time ago, actually. And some of the computation will reappear here, but in the stochastic case, there was almost nothing done uh, in the literature. So again, our point of view is to start with the toy model and see what's going on. Right? So this is our problem. Obviously, when tau equals zero, it means that there is no lending or borrowing. You borrow it, you have to give it back right away, so there is no lending and borrowing. If tau equals t, we have, we have this, uh, this uh, boundary condition here. So if tau equals t, it means that you don't have to give back anything. So that was the previous case. Right? So we go from no lending and borrowing to the previous case. There is a full range in between. 